Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, we're getting ready to do our weekly Bible study. I'm Scott Mendes. Glad you could be with us and tuning in this morning. As usual, we're going to allow a few people to jump on here um, so we can get a sound check and make sure that everything is going good. And then uh, get right into God's Word. Thank you guys so much for following us and partnering with us. We're excited. Amen. God is good all the time. So as, as a few of you guys jump on here, we're getting ready with the message this week. We'll see if we can get a couple of you guys on here. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> all right. Good morning, Casey, Jesse, faithful warriors. Pray that you guys are doing good with your families where you're at out there. We're making and enduring here in Texas. So let's get a sound check just in case. I've got a couple little fans here in the office. Sound pretty good this morning? Awesome. I know I get excited sometimes and get uh, get a little loud. So I guess if you have to, turn me down just a little bit from time to time. Well, I'm Scott Mendes. We're getting ready for our weekly Bible study. And uh, what we like to do is have you, um, you know, get your Bibles out, something to write with. If you uh, have the ability to do that, if you're just driving, tune it up, turn it up, listen to it. We'll try to rebroadcast these on some different platforms, and uh, and that way you guys can share them as well. As you know, we don't have any in-house techs that are really helping us, so we just turn this thing on and get after it. But we do have some great meetings and some things coming up here in the near future with some of our uh, various media outreaches. So if the if the sound is good and we're getting a few more people jumping on here, um, then we're excited to get into God's Word. As we always do, we want to open up a little bit in prayer. And uh, thank you guys for partnering with us and and uh, being with us each week and always sharing this. Good morning, Miss Deborah, William. God is good. Amen. So let's do this. We're going to open up in prayer, and then I've got a great message put together. As you know, each week I just kind of pray and look at our country and our culture and, and try to ask God to give us something valuable to get through uh, each and every week. Good morning, Brett. Thank you guys for being on here. Um, I wish I could interact a little bit when we're teaching, but uh, I don't always get to do that. So anyway, having said that, uh, while you guys are on here this morning, let's open up in prayer. As you know, um, it's supposed to be felt hat season here in Texas. We went to the ranch rodeo last night here in Parker County, and let me tell you something. Uh, if I had a straw hat on last night, my head would be about the size of a raisin right now. So uh, it's it's still incredibly hot here, being September like it is. But um, anyway, we're we're uh, excited. We were able to go to the rodeo. We've got some meetings coming up this week with our ministry and media. I know you guys uh, wonder if what I'm talking about is going to come to pass. We're always working on the backside. And that's why we really trust and hope that you guys will share these messages as we archive them and uh, are able to use them in various ways. I'm not sure how all the censorship works, but it seems to me like uh, there are times that we are. So anyway, um, we also have got some big things coming up for discipleship. We've got some books and things ordered here for the local people in Weatherford. But there's some ways that me and some of the other speakers through the FCA are thinking about trying to introduce uh, how we can do these things on some various Zoom calls and stuff like that. So uh, being uh, with other ranchers, farmers, rodeo athletes, um, it's going to get real excited. So thank you guys so much for being a part of Western Harvest Ministry. So anyway, having said that, in order to stay on track and ride on course with you guys this morning, we really, really need to um, stay uh, a, a, a within that hour frame that we have. So having said that, let's uh, see if we can go ahead and go before the Lord and pray this morning. As you know, we need to pray for the globe, the world that God created around the world. We need to pray for our government and leaders and elections coming up. There's a lot of stuff happening. And we really, as believers and children of God, uh, we have to do our part, and I pray that these messages encourage us each week uh, to, to learn and discern what that is, and then be faithful and obedient to go execute and apply the Word of God. Otherwise, we're just deceiving ourselves. 
So the enemy has a plan against us. Sometimes our own flesh and our own thoughts do. So that's what we want to do is we want to renew our mind to God's word, be discipled, be a follower of Christ, not putting any labels on our whatever our beliefs are. There's a lot of people that we agree with and disagree, but we should always agree on the absolutes. You know, why did Jesus come? Why am I here? Where am I going? Uh, these are things that we can agree upon and we can build on. Not everybody's going to agree 100% the same, but we're not going to allow the enemy to divide us and separate us uh, in those beliefs. Amen? So let's do this. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and then we're going to get in our message this morning. Again, share it right down. Uh, this is going to be coming from Mark chapter 6, which I want you guys to just really try to go read that chapter. It'll make a little bit of... Um, a little better sense of what we're going to be teaching about. So if you can, write that down and let's get ready uh, for our study this morning on Writing on Course. I'm Scott Mendes with Western Harvest. Will you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. Lord, we thank you that you have created this day, that you got all of us out of bed. You have a plan for us, Lord God. And as we study your word, Father, we're being renewed day by day and through faith, Lord. Your, your faith re-energizes us. It strengthens us, Lord God. So we pray that the reading of your word and the message this week will change our lives. Lord, we pray for our partners, those that have been sick and, and those that have been discouraged and those, Father God, that are uh, tired. We pray that this word will encourage them, strengthen them. Lord, we know you want us healthy. We know you want us healed. We know that you want to prosper us, Lord, according to your word, not taking it out of text. Lord, we know that we're flawed and imperfect, but we ask forgiveness of our sins. We ask forgiveness of our shortcoming. And Father, together in the unifying of the assembly of the brethren and the sister as a body of Christ, great things are in store as we depend upon you to perform your word you said you would send your word and that it would not return back void that it would accomplish what you send it to do so we agree with your word today we love those that have are lost those that are hurting those that are depleted may we engage equip and empower them today with your love with what your son jesus has done and lord god if there's ever been a time we pray for our world, the world that you created, the world that you gave your children to subdue, to oversee, to steward. I pray, Father God, right now with all the evil and all the deception that we would not be in fear. We would be in faith and our faith would overcome this world. And we thank you that Jesus is our example of a great leader. And so today, Father, we ask that we would be healthy, whole, not missing anything, not lacking anything. We are above and not beneath. We're the head, not the tail. But Lord God, more importantly, we understand that your word is our course that we ride on. It is the direction that we want to be in. And so, Father, right now we pray for children that are lost, loved ones that don't know your word, loved ones that will hear this message and desire to have more of you that they would pray this prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Redirect my life 180 degrees in the new direction as I want to be a new creation. I want to know with assurance why I'm here, what I'm here for, and where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. Eternity. And Father, that is found in heaven with you. And by your word, heaven and earth will pass away, but your word shall remain forever and ever. And so, Father, we thank you right now that we pray for our country, our leaders, that you would miraculously intervene and step in, take control of the election, take control of the world, and give your children the duty and the power and the authority as you have of what we are clearly to do. And we would focus on that and not the distractions and not the fearful things that get us immobilized and shut down. We're going to press in, Father God. We're going to draw close to you and allow you to draw close to us, as your word says. So we love you, we praise you, and we ask that you use this time of study today 
that you may be glorified and that you may love your children and that we may love you because we know you first loved us. We praise you and ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, Gail and Maya and everybody. I'm excited about what we want to study on this week. I know in the past weeks we talked about how God's Word uh, washes us, cleanses us. We talked about courage. We talked about how to define and recognize and expose uh, deception. And so this world is full of evil content. But here's how you're going to win. When you're not in the world system, then we can beat the system. Amen? And so that means putting the blood of Christ over your family, securing your finances, and sowing into God's work, and, you know, doing the things that God has required and commissioned us to do. Some of you don't know truly what that is because some of us were taught error. We were in wrong places and taught differently, and and, and, and God is changing. God is in a season of exposing who is truly His children. And, and if you want to study it, maybe we'll come down the road. I've been reading a little bit the difference between goats and sheep. Goat nations, sheep nations. You know, goats don't follow leaders, but yet sheep only hear the shepherd's voice. God has said, who stepped in and sowed tares into your harvest? So what is the difference between a tear and the wheat? The wheat has value and the tares will choke the life out of the wheat. And so all these things and all these signs of the times that we live in are miraculous. And so we have to understand when we're studying God's Word uh, what it truly means at face value. Amen. So I gave you a little bit of indication of what we want to talk about. Today I would ask you to just go to Matthew chapter 6. Excuse me, not Matthew, Mark chapter 6. And I know last week we talked about prayer. I pray that that was a, a great teaching and it helped your family. And uh, excuse me, I got the hiccups and that you guys uh, really got something out of it. Sometimes these messages are really fun to put together and just to compile. So in Matthew 6, the first scripture that I want to read to tell you a little bit about is Matthew 6.34. And this is where Jesus said, And Jesus said, When He came out, He saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So He began to teach them many things. And so again, after we studied prayer, Last week we talked about deception, we talked about the courage that's needed to be Christ-like, to be a follower, a child of God. As we talk about these things, I just felt led that this week we would talk about the exemplification of leadership. So we want to call this message, Riding with Jesus on Leadership, right? So He's our example. Now a lot of guys will want to buy into the Anthony Robbins and all the, you know, Dr. Maxwell... Look, those guys are great to be positive and to be encouraged, and some people need that. But again, what we need is the Word of God as a foundation, as an absolute truth. And so we have to believe God's Word at face value. So I was reading in Mark 6 this week, and as I begin to look at this chapter, you'll have to look at it because we're going to only look at the examples of Jesus' leadership which is what we need today. There's so much division between the left and the right and the, you know, the Democrat and the Republican, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, God has given us the ability to love Him, to serve Him, and we need to understand what our role is. And again, as I prayed earlier, when you draw close to God, God will draw close to you. Amen? So, let's talk about that today. Have you ever heard <clears throat> the uh, the genuine leadership statement that says, uh, in the absence of genuine leadership, people will listen to whoever steps up to the microphone, right? Well, we see that today of the enemy. And a lot of the things that you're going to notice in today's message, uh, as it came out of Mark chapter 6, 
we, we need to understand it in text. What was Jesus saying? Why did he say it? And who did he was who is he saying it to? So as I read the chapter of Mark 6, there's some amazing things in there. It'll tell you how the head of John the Baptist was rendered on a platter, uh, that God gave his apostles, some would say disciples, uh, uh, power over unclean spirits. Uh, it goes as far as to have some, uh, uh, some lap dancing and some daughters of kings and wives and all kinds of crazy things are going on in there. And again, we don't have time to read the whole chapter, but I encourage you to, because the first thing we're going to see is as Jesus was working with his disciples, he saw that they needed something and he challenged them to do this. And that's what this message is going to challenge us to do. So some have heard this statement uh, that we'll get into a little bit more. But again, um, whoever made that statement that I just quoted a minute ago certainly was not talking about Jesus because we're not to just listen to whoever steps up to the mic. And we see this going on in our government today. Well, let's go on. In Mark chapter 6, there's so many characteristics that made Jesus uh, a great uh, and powerful leader. So let's talk about that. We want to study about three points today, right? Three things that will help us. We want to understand the needs and the wants that the people that you are leading. And I want to apply this to us. Jesus did an, ex an awesome job of those that he was leading. But Jesus' characteristic, Jesus' character is in us today. It should be. That's what discipleship is all about. Knowing the scriptures as our compass, as our bylaws, as our everything in our business over our family like what we pray what we believe how we speak how we act and so in a world that's full of hate and anger and chaos and division the world thinks they have the answers but you and i have the answers of what's going on today if we're not in fear right jesus does not give you a spirit of fear but a power love and of a sound mind and so leadership is the opposite of chaos and the leadership that we're seeing today in our governments in our local communities even in our churches don't think that satan is not in the church he is in some churches and and, and then again god has got some powerful ministries and churches out there as well your job in discernment is to discover where god wants you to be and how you're able to study to show yourself approved and that's exactly what again what discipleship is all about so Jesus understood the needs and the wants of the people that he was leading. Maybe you and I should look at that example too. Who are you called to? Who can you lead? Right? Corporately, individually, as your family. Second thing was Jesus was selfless. Now the world and the system of the world is trying to get you into self. That's why I have a problem with all the Anthony Robbins and all the positive things. Yes, you need to be positive. But you can be just as positive by spending quality time with your Creator in His Word. Also, Jesus loved the people that He was leading. Amen? you got to have a passion for what you do. you got to love people. and you got to understand where does our doctrine come from. Where, 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 where is the greatest leadership, right? So we're looking at Jesus, writing with Jesus under the title of leadership so let's look at that have you ever heard the expression and i have and i wrote it down and let's just read it uh people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care i can remember that rodeo and dr maxwell's book you know maximizing success in your life and all those things nothing wrong with them it made me a very positive person but you can be positive all you want and still be on your way to hell because if you're not selfless and you're all about self and we like to control people and step on people in our leadership, then you're not a servant leader. And maybe you don't really love the ones that you're leading. You only love them as long as they're patting your pockets and buying your products and so forth and so forth, right? I don't want to get into that. And yes, I have products that we love and hope to get out to you guys very soon. So let's go on. Uh, it, it, it's a wise saying but it is something that we can learn from. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Let's define that a little bit. 
See, that statement was talking about evangelism and the importance to getting to know how to love your neighbor. And that's why this message is important. There's people in our country, and I'm not just telling you, go out there and play with fire and put God to the test and all those things. There are evil people in this world, here, around the globe, different countries. But at the end of the day, God created people. And God loves His creation and God loves people. And there are some people that are very, very evil and wicked. And God knows how to deal with them too. So you just don't, you know, a baby on a battlefield. You don't just go out there and try to apply this. You have to know who you're ministering to. You know how, how what, the, what their needs are and how to love them. So just hear what I'm saying this morning. So you you got to love your neighbors. If you're going to help people find Jesus, we have to know them. We have to... We have to allow them to know us, right? That means giving of our time and letting people into our lives. See, the world right now has got us all shut down into the media and it's controlling the narrative. It's like it's turning off the frontal lobe to be able to make decisions for yourself. To read a book. You'd rather, you know, have it on the internet. You have all these kind of things. And so we have to kind of go back to what once was in a successful way quiet time turn off the media read a book spend time with eating dinner with your family as much as possible you know eating healthy things of uh, doing things with purpose and that's exactly a true form of love that we're talking about so we have to spend time with them we have to understand that all the people well let me back up and just say this this means giving and letting people into our life right and so do you know your neighbor do you know those that go to your church, those that come? Are you outgoing and loving and caring and compassionate? Jesus was, and so we have to be too, right? To a certain degree. And again, I'm not just telling you to get out there and, 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 and put God to the test or whatever. So when we take the time to know our neighbors, we will find out that we all have something in common. Most of the people, most all of them, and you and I are going through adversity and challenges in our life and what we really need is we need a form of encouragement right and so again it's not it's not bad to be a positive thinker or anything like that it's just if you're going to spend quality time you have to know what is the motive of your heart where is your character are you doing these things to be famous are you doing these things to be wealthy so god knows and even the bible judge the discernment uh, the intents of your heart. So God knows these things, right? So let's go on and look at it a little bit more. Of course, we cannot help them if we do not take the time to understand what are they struggling with. Right now, we see a world that the moral fabrics are being desensorized. The, the things that we stood for over time and through education system are beginning to bring another narrative and another ideology, right, uh, to our country. And so even our children will be disobedient and, and even things in our culture will be different and be open and blunt and right in our face and tell us what they're going to do, meaning the enemy. But we have to be strong. We have to be in the full armor of God, dressed for the party. And we need to understand this is a battle that is spiritual. And how do we win a spiritual battle? We win that by renewing our mind. By doing the things that God talked about. So Jesus is talking here about evangelizing, loving your neighbor, knowing what they're going through, and putting their needs above our needs, right? So this is a good teaching, and we need to understand that. As we read through this chapter, Mark chapter 6, we don't have time to read it all, but we're going to pull from it today. As you read through this chapter, you will notice that when Jesus was traveling with his disciples, they had need of something and God met their needs, right? And so he would continue to teach them while he was spending time. And that's, again, why you need to be in a prayer group, why you need to be involved in a ministry. If you can't go, send somebody. Help somebody to do the things that you believe in. And, 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 and even though there's a big world out there, there's specific people that align with you and, and you can help them. And that's important. So... That is what great leaders do. They continue to teach, and we need to teach from God's Word. We don't cherry-pick it. We don't have a replacement theology. We don't pull from it, make it to say what we want. 
and then go about our way and forget about it and let it get dust on the coffee table no we use it in every aspect of our life every thought that we have every way that we speak every way that we conduct ourselves we walk in love we know those that we're ministering to and that's what this message is about great leaders understand the needs of their people that they are leading just as jesus understood the needs of his apostles so let's look at this scripture right here as we get ready uh to study more about this today mark chapter 6 verse 30 and uh let's look mark 6 30 and 31 this is what it says in the new king james amen uh mark 6 30 and 31 he says then the apostles gathered to jesus and told him all the things both what they had done and what they had taught verse 31 and he said to them come aside by yourselves to a, de a deserted place and rest for a while for there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat well it's been said as you guys have heard it probably many times and i say it in my family and my ministry is that i would rather be fruitful than busy see busy just means that you're putting out fires and and all kinds of things are going on but are you really getting closer to your goal and so the devil is a masquerade he is the master of deception and so if he can't change your doctrine and your belief what he can do is he can immobilize you by keeping you busy knowing that you're going to the wrong church knowing that you're not really effective with those that you're trying to minister to and especially your own household right and then your church your community how can i be effective and what must i do to really put the devil underneath my justice right see the devil is defeated already and we're waiting for god to do it but god's empowered us to maintain and steward this world until he returns for us and so when you have your foot on the devil devil's neck do not take it off do not let him up don't have any compassion for him hold him at bay hold his strategies his ideologies the symbols the secret things of this world that people do and they think that they've got one up on everybody but that's not the case you are god's creation god loves you and god's got a plan so let's go on as we read that he saw a need and he told them come aside and rest right and they were so busy and god recognized that and that is exactly why he's given us a sabbath day the first fruit the first day and i'm here to tell you i can't talk about the things that we see coming in the near future with a one world church and all these kind of things but i'm telling you our liberties our freedoms to worship and serve our god these things are going to change and they're on opposite days they're on different calendars there's all kinds of stuff that's crazy but let God be God and let's do what we can do to help him. So the first thing we want to see here is we want to talk about Jesus was selfless, right? He knew the needs of his disciples. He took care of that, of the apostles. And we should too. Come come aside, rest, eat, uh, enjoy and keep the Sabbath, which sometimes isn't on the right day and all that. But hey, God knows, right? So let's go on. The Bible teaches us that we are to spend time on earth doing two things. That's what I'm saying. We get distracted with taking care of ourselves when self is on. We get bombarded with the cares and the ruts of life. What's in it for me? I need this. I want this. Especially young people looking for identity, looking for fame, looking for popularity, doing everything culturally to fit in. But you have to know who you are and whose you are, right? I rode bulls, but that wasn't just what I was. I wasn't just a bull rider. I was a child of God. And I had to learn my ways through the struggles, the temptations, and the things that we had to do in that business, in that industry, right? And then we're in ministry. We have to do things uh, to, to recognize the stronghold that the enemy has on the churches and the ministries out there that are teaching false doctrine. you got to cut through all those things to get down to the elementary teaching of God and so the two things that God tells us in his leadership through the example of his son is that we are to glorify God number one number two we are to serve others to know their needs to spend time to have compassion Jesus 
was compassion. But he also, you know, spoke into the evil people as well. And so you got to be well balanced. So you see in Matthew 20, don't turn there, I'm just going to read it to you, write it down. Matthew 20, 26 and through 28 says this. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Again, you have to go to seminary to get that mixed up, right? You have to just read that at face value. Jesus didn't come to be served. What about the teachers today that are using uh, positive thinking? They're using cultural music and entertainment, smoke and mirror, and all these things in the sanctuary, and all the lifestyle about you have an elite group of people that put the, the, the common people at bay and hold them, and, and they're slave, they're master, they're in bondage, they're in all these kind of things. But Jesus said the truth that you know will set you free. Amen. So what we have to do is we have to recognize, discern that God has commissioned us through the example of His Son to glorify Him and to love and to serve others as a servant leader. There's two different types of leaders in this world and we see the leaders of the church today coming and asking to be served rather than serving. If you're in that type of ministry, that type of church, that type of podcast, turn it off. Because what happens is it comes into your eye, comes into your ear, <clears throat> you're around it a lot, it takes the most dominant place in your heart, drops down into your spirit, and you say, hey, that's pretty cool, I want to be a part of that. I want to sow into it, I want to get those kind of things, I want to read, learn those principles, but those principles would be the wrong motive of the heart, so be very careful. Let's go on. Again, that was Matthew 20. 26, 27, and 28. Jesus didn't come to serve. He came to serve. And He gave His life for a ransom for many. You and I. I am indebted to my Father for what He did. It was free, but I don't just use sloppy grace and go live my life and keep sinning and saying that Jesus is going to provide a place for me in heaven. You have your part to play. And it's when you're truly saved, you want to do these things. It's not in works. And only the devil and false doctrine would try to put that label on you. I don't want any labels other than to be Christ-like, to love my family, to know why I'm here, and to know what I'm called to do, and to execute the gifts that God gave me with all diligence, right? Glorify God, serve others. And in this world right now, we are separated, we are in hate, which is what the world's trying to do, cause division, black and white, left and right different cultures no we love all people but there are some that have been turned over to a reprobate that are not coming and they're coming at it with a hate and that's the gospel that we have is a, is a gospel of love so let's go on so through his life and his death we see that jesus his priorities were in order number one thing that jesus did he came to do his father's will you and I are called to do the will of our Father, which Jesus is delegated authority from God the Father, the Creator, through the Son, who manifested in the flesh and gave Himself as a ransom. Right? So, if Jesus was called to do His Father's will, you and I must be about our Father's business as well. Remember Jesus when He was left behind by Mary and Joseph? He was in a synagogue at twelve. And the priests were like, who is he? Where did he come from? He speaks with such wisdom. A wisdom that they would eventually kill him for because he was the son of man. And he's our example of a great leader. And we need leadership in this nation. And we better get out and execute our rights and vote our beliefs. <clears throat> very, very important. Right? And then God will do what he is going to do. So he came to do his father's will. He came to save the world from their sin. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And although we can never be anything like Jesus, there was only one that was perfect, it was Jesus. We are called to live a holy life. 
and many people that are caught in hyper sloppy grace with replacement theology Calvinism different versions all these types of fighting they miss the mark and the devil wins because there's so much strife and where there is strife and division there is every evil work even to the point of witchcraft right and so the devil immobilizes the church because they're fighting and, eat, and eating their own. We need to unify in love by serving and knowing the needs of the people that we're leading to Christ. That is true evangelism. We need evangelism. We need the body of Christ to raise and disciple. The pastor has his part. You know, the teachers have their part. The service of good works has their part. It all works together. A body decently fit joined together will run properly right and so our character of trying to be like our father in heaven is exactly what defines our character and apart from him we can do nothing let's go on there is a saying if you chase perfection then you just might catch excellence right i remember signing my autograph and it was like shoot for the shoot for the moon and you might hit a star right same kind of concept and that's why I don't like this, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace and just keep doing what you do. And never <clears throat> truly having a covenant relationship, knowing your identity in Christ and knowing your purpose in this life, right? Yes, you are an old sinner saved by grace, but then you are called to rise up and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. A workman right and dividing the word of truth, right? and being about prayer and fasting and doing your job so we got to understand that and even though we will never be uh perfect striving for his striving to be perfect gets the most out of the talents that we have been blessed with god loves you god gave you something he will tell you right now like he told me and he told many other leaders moses he says what is in your hand all i have is a staff oh by the way i have you know my my brother and he can speak for me because I can't speak. And, and God will make provision. We want Him to show us everything so we can make a decision. I don't really want to do that. Did He call you to go to Bible college? Did He call you to quit your job and step out in faith? Did He call you to change your attitude of how you look at the people at work? Did He try to get you off of your mind so that you could have Jesus on your heart to serve others? Yes and amen and all these type of things. So let's go on. That is how God is glorified is when we do the work of the Father. We see Jesus was sent to exemplify our character. Serving others is a reoccurring theme in the Bible. What would happen if we did that today? It's just the opposite. Everything is about self, tabloids, movie, positive thinking, conventions. Everything is, hey, I deserve this. I need to be woke to this. I, I'm entitled to this. Put a label on and then coward under your label and then the world has the answer. You have this. You have that. We got the medicine for that. We got this for you. You need to go to this camp. You need to buy into this. Pretty soon, you're so far from the truth that you're lost. And I pray that this message will help us come back into unity with our Father. Simply put, we as Christians are supposed to to do this glorify God serve others glorify God serve others glorify God and serve others how do you glorify God if in fact your doctrine has told you that God is mad at you you must give me your money so that you can be like me and have all these riches and you know blah 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 so you got to know how to serve and to love God let's go on we can read about the importance of serving others in these three verses that I highlighted for us today. First of all, let's look at Acts. I'm going to read them to you. Just jot them down or rewind this someday. Ox, uh, excuse me, Ox. Acts 20 and verse 35 says this. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Well, when you have self on your mind, the flesh kind of likes certain things. It likes more money, likes more sugar, likes more alcohol, likes more notoriety. It loves all of these things. And so if you're in self, your flesh is leading your life. 
your flesh has feelings your flesh has a mind and whatever you feed your mind will dictate what your feelings are and if you're trying to follow God by not knowing his voice and allowing your feelings to lead you astray you better get your soul your mind your will and your emotion lined up into what God is saying he said glorify God serve others and here's my son Jesus as the ultimate and ex uh, supreme example of who we are supposed to do. Remember the little bracelet that was going around. It said, what would Jesus do? I know what Jesus would do according to his word, but that leaves a little bit of room and error for me. I want to do a campaign that says it is written. Because every time Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he was hungry. He tried to throw kingdoms and powers to him. And every time on those three temptations, the pride of life and the lust of the flesh, Jesus said, it is written. When was the last time you told the devil, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not. And you begin to speak out of your mouth the authority that God gave you to overcome the enemy. Because we know that Jesus knows how to do it. Jesus did it, and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And some of your churches are teaching you that God will do it just for you all on His own, if you were worthy. I'm here to tell you, check your doctrine, check your beliefs. In order to change the fruit, you have to change the root. The devil's really good at allowing you to have a piece of the truth, but he doesn't want you to get to the core of the matter. The core of the matter is the condition of a man's heart. And if your heart has never truly been saved, redeemed, or repented, or if you're struggling, you can't expect what we're talking about today or the last few weeks to be available to you. It's available to you, but you have not received it. And that's why we keep having to chip away at the mind, chip away at the heart. God's Word is a two-edged sword. And we're talking about being a steward leader. We're talking about being Christ-like and having the character that glorifies God by getting self off of your mind. Looking at the world around you and seeing that everybody is going to hell in a handbasket because they've been deceived, because they've been complacent in their religion and their theology. And they think, well, I'll just take care of myself. Jesus is coming back. I got my fire insurance. Every time I need something from God, I'll rub the genie bottle and he'll pop out. And then I'll get my answers to my wishes. It doesn't work that way. And when we stand before the judgment seat of God, he will hold us accountable for what we did with the talents, the gifts, the people, the influence, the wealth, the blessings that he gave us. And it's all jotted down. So let's go on. That was the first little scripture. 1 Peter 4.10 we're talking about the importance of serving others. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, As each one of us has received a special gift. You don't know where to start. You're depressed. You have anxiety. You don't think you have anything. You're down to your last dollar. What do you do? You stir up the gifts as Paul, as, as Paul encouraged Timothy. Stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. What is your gift? Do you like to talk? then talk about Jesus. Do you like to serve others? Then get to a ministry because there's plenty of things to do in a ministry. I'll tell you. The Holy Spirit shows up in overalls around this arena, around this ranch, right? Because there's lots to do for the spirit of excellence, striving to let people know about Christ because the world is coming after Christ in us. They don't hate you. They hate the Christ in you. And so what we have to do as each one of us has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards. I don't own anything that I have. God has entrusted my family, our ministry. God has entrusted your family and your ministry with gifts, with talents, with treasures. You can either go bury it, hide it in fear, or you can go invest it into the kingdom of God and at least try to draw interest on it. Be wise and be a man of character. Uh, uh, that, uh, let me go on. To serve others as good student and the manifold grace of God. That was 1 Peter 4.10. One more. Galatians 5 verses 13 and 14 say this. Through love 
serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement that you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. So God is saying my whole law is in this one word, love. L-O-V-E. Well, the world will love you conditionally. What can you do for me? And I know this in my testimony and I plan on telling my story. You guys will see it soon in a, in a powerful way. But here's the deal. Unconditional love. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. But it is in us when we receive Jesus as our Lord. We don't pray to God through Mary. We don't you know, know God but don't know His Son. His Son wasn't just somebody that walked the earth. It was the Son of God in flesh. And this is what separates us from the world. And it's the very thing that will get us killed and persecuted but god said be a good cheer i am with you those that endure to the end so we should be happy we should be content and we should be in faith and we should be glorifying god and serving others when we have all that on our mind we don't have time for the world system we're not going to uh, be concerned with it we'll do our part but we're about the father's business right and that's why i wanted to bring this message so through love serve one another and all of the law is fulfilled in this one word love did you have a father that loved you? Did you know your mother and father? Because there's a lot of people that were adopted. There is no excuse. God said, I would be the father to the fatherless. My father loved me, but my father didn't know how to teach me the Bible. My mother loved me and taught me the Bible. And we had faith, but we didn't have food. And we had holes in our clothes. And we were basically homeless through a lot of adversity and I'll tell more of that most people don't know it's coming down the road anyway listen to this Jesus was selfless right so we talked about knowing the needs of those that we're ministering to we talked about the importance of of that Jesus was selfless as soon as we died as self we begin to operate and desire this kind of love in our life because God freely gave me love and he was my father when my father did the best that he could. I love and forgive my earthly father, but I love my heavenly father and I'll be about his business, right? So maybe you can identify with those things that I'm saying. Maybe you're trying to find love in the wrong places. Many relationships, looking for somebody in your government to love you and hand things out. That ain't going to happen. That's not our source. It may be for some, but our true source is God's word and God's ways and God's leadership right let's go on he puts uh, he put the wants and the needs in those that he is leading ahead of himself what would the world be like today if you and I put the needs of those that we're ministering to in a different light this is what great leaders do to be a servant leader so we prayed and what did God tell us what's in your hand know your doctrine know your know the gospel the good news and the hope thereof right this thing is watered down with all the technology and all the things we have available. It is so watered down <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that it is almost powerless. <coughs> excuse me, Having a form of godliness and denying its power. There is no greater example of what Jesus loved us for and did for us than the crucifixion. His unconditional love for us. He Himself bore our sin. Let me read 1 Peter 224 he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds we were healed right we are to die to sin the sin of thinking that we can have it all ourselves, or that we know everything we don't know anything except for what god reveals through his holy spirit and he gave us the word and he expects us to study it that's how we know him Amen. So we die to sin, we live to righteousness. That's all about Romans 7. Why do I do the things that I don't want to do? Read Romans 8. Because you are more than a conqueror through Him who loves you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? The way that we overcome the flesh is by walking in the Spirit and knowing that you're in a spiritual battle and conquering the beast that rages to kill your soul. Jesus said, don't worry about those that can kill your body. Why are we in fear today? Don't worry about those. Worry about those that can kill your soul. Right here in the frontal lobe of your mind, all the media that we ingest and regurgitate 
It kills us. We need to have new life. Freedom of, 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 of experiencing Jesus. Let's go on. Loving the people that you are leading. In professional sports, there's good teams. There's great teams and there's dynasties, right? Those teams that are once in a life, they are the best things and they have one thing in common. They love each other. That's why I said the church in the Bible isn't the building, it's the people. And we are to love other people. And that is the difference between the Western religion and the Eastern religion. They're coming and they're going to try to make you bow down and kiss their ring. They got a doctrine and they want you sucked into that vacuum. And so, again, I'm touching on stuff I can't teach on unless you were right here in person. But I'm telling you, there's things that are out there that are devastating our country. What we believe, why God gave us this country is so that America could evangelize the world. And, 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 and that's what we should be about and that's what we should be doing. When we think about Jesus and sacrifice that He made for us, His love becomes obvious. We ask ourselves, why would somebody endure such violent death voluntarily? The answer is obvious because that is how much Jesus loves you and that is how much Jesus loves me. It's not all about the toys, the money, and the power. But it is for those that are drinking the wine of power and lusting after other things. They think they won't be caught. They're being caught every day. You see mega churches falling. The year of exposure, right? So how are we going to rebuild those? What are we going to do with those people that have been hurt? Finding out that their money has been misused. Finding out that their pastor is involved in evil things, right? And pastors aren't perfect. People can fall. But let me tell you the thing that the church is missing. Repentance. You can't have revival just around the music. You can't have revival just because you're dunking people. You need to have a transformation of heart. And that's through discipleship. That's through knowing who you're loving. And that's doing what God has called us to do. Let me go on real quick. I'm speeding up. but And love is the most important characteristic of a great leader. Love, not pride. If you serve in somebody that needs, that wants to be served, his name on his own parking lot, his Ferrari out in front of the church, his million dollar mansion, all those kind of things, or even people that just go around and do things as the world does it. You and I are called to be separate and chosen and set apart. What does that mean? Study it. That's what we study here. People can tell if their leaders care about them, and when they do, they get the most out of those that they are leading. When people know their true leader genuinely wants to see them succeed and develop, then they are much more happy. They are much more productive, and it's all glorification to God's Word. Unity. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. Together, we can accomplish. Do not forsake the assembly of the brethren. Iron sharpens iron. Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. See, we're countering, pushing back what the world is trying to sell us today. Be in fear. Stay in your home. Don't do this. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there's evil things out there. That's right. But greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. And I'm not, I'm not playing by your system. When it comes to Jesus, he demonstrates his love for us repeatedly throughout the Bible. The most powerful example of that love is when Jesus has for his sinners in the world, in his word. And he spoke to them on the cross right before he died. This is what the Luke says, and I'm getting ready to conclude. Luke 23 and verse 33 and 34 says it this way. When they came to the place called the skull, they, uh, there they crucified him and the criminals. A gruesome, horrifying death. The King of Kings, Son of God in the flesh is being martyred and killed with criminals. Like he's just the lowest of the lowest. But they missed the mark. They didn't receive him. They rejected him because he had power. They knew not where it came from. And they were in control. The religious leaders of those days and the kings of those times. Do we see that happening today? Open your eyes. We are not entitled to anything except to love God and to serve God and to serve others. Right? Okay, so with criminals on one on the right and on the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father... Forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Amen. We have to forgive those that don't know what they're doing. We have to try to witness Jesus. And if they don't receive, read in Mark 6. 
dust off your sandals and move out into the other things that God has called you to do. So let me conclude this today by simply saying the world needs great leaders. Because of the absence of true leadership, we see that every day in the media and the government and the county and the local level, whatever, in the church. We see it. People will listen to whoever steps up to the mic, right? But we need to have great leaders and we need to have our absolute authority coming from God and His Word to conquer the beast. There is no greater example of leadership than Jesus Himself. Through His actions and His teaching, we see all the great leadership characteristics that Jesus displayed, including these three. Jesus understood the needs of those that He was leading. Jesus was selfless. And also Jesus loved the people that He was leading. Now I want to leave you with this scripture before I pray with you. Hebrews 13.7 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the Word of God to you, and considering the results of their conduct, imitate their faith. Paul said this. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's what I'm saying to you, our friends and partners of Western Harvest, as we discover every week how to ride on course with our destiny, with the purpose of what God has called us, right? We are to use the Word of God. We are to love the example of Jesus. And we are to know that God has all things in the power and the control. And He will set this order, uh, the divine order of the world around us, as we trust Him and as we serve Him. Amen. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that this message will stir up the gifts of great leaders. We pray for their ministries. We pray for their needs. We love them. We ask that this message will go everywhere and all places to glorify you and to help us to trump the hate, the evil, the secret societal type stuff that people are involved in. We would break the bondage for we know your, your, your yoke is light and your word breaks the burden that we carry, uh, that we have been placed on through wrong teaching and just being complacent. Lord God, stir us up to love you around the world. Let the America be the light of the world that will evangelize and that the word will go forth in our families, in our countries, and in our communities. That you be glorified. Not us. We're not selfish. That you be glorified. And that we may be steward leaders and to subdue the earth and to maintain it with your Holy Spirit helping us every day of our life to focus on what truly is most important. Getting ready as your bride to return for us and keeping us safe providing the needs that we have in our family, keeping our body healthy, helping us to exercise it, helping us to know the signs of the times that we live in and where to be and what to say. May you protect us. May you have your way in our life. We glorify you. We praise you. We thank you for this teaching. In Jesus' name, and all of God's children said, Amen and Amen. Listen, I'm Scott Mendes. Great things coming through this ministry. Thank you for your partnership. And we uh, love you and we pray that you'll be a great leader in your community and your family by studying God's word and conquering the beast that rages in the soul in your life. Until next week, we love you. We'll see you down the road. I'm Scott Mendes. Remember, God loves you. We love you. And right on course, we'll see you. God bless. Remember to share this. See you.